This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Con Report. Wherever you get your podcast, you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. That's AMP, IRE. Always much appreciated when you tune in. And don't forget, you can always catch my work on ESPN.com. And in a minute, I'm going to be joined by former Washington tight end Logan Paulson as we go over the Shanahan coaching tree because it may pertain to this team in a few weeks. Why has it been so successful when you look at, and, and this team is actually facing that tree quite a bit over the last over the last month of the season or so. They had just faced Mike McDaniel, going to face Sean McVay on, on Sunday, then Kyle Shanahan in a couple, a couple of weeks. And Robert Sala in, in a couple weeks too, but I'm looking more at the offensive side of things, why it's been so successful and things that low, because Logan Paulson has been around all these coaches, things that he picked up from observing them. And it goes beyond just the scheme. If all you have is a scheme, it may not work. You have to be able there are a lot of other things that go into it than just, Hey, can you call plays or not? So stay tuned for that. And then we also get into a little bit of Sam Howell and how players handle a situation like Washington is in now and why it still matters to a lot of guys on this team, you know, and, and so um, also um, yeah, anyways, so stay tuned for that before I get there, just a couple of things. I'm not going to take a lot of time here. Uh, one, we learned on Monday that Jamin Davis out for the year, shoulder surgery. Um, you know, there you go. He's, he's had a pretty good year, um, but defense is what it is. So the, the key thing for him is, will they pick up that fifth year option in the off season? And, and it's not even worth talking about because we don't even know who, who the coach is, what the scheme is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, but he's done for the year. Emmanuel Forbes um, has that, has that elbow injury. Good chance that he'll be back out this week. They fitted him for a brace and I, I, there is some optimism that he'll return this week. I think it's important for him to get back out there and see if he can, maybe finish strong this season and and give this franchise something they can build on with him in the future. And there's a lot of work that need to be done with him, just kind of getting him out of some college habits um, that, that they really saw pop up uh, during the season and just, you know, from techniques and all that. So anyways, key stretch for him, Derek Forrest, not sure yet if he's going to be back or when he'll be back. Ricky Stromberg not going to come back. Sadiq Charles is going to they'll know a little bit more as we return on Wednesday to the facility. Anyways, that's really all I got from me. You know, you want to hear from Logan Paulson. It was a good conversation, as it always is with Logan. And I think you'll learn some things about some about why that again, why that Shanahan tree has been so effective. And someone that you can watch who can emerge from that tree, um, possibly a, a, after the season here. So that's it from me. Stay tuned for my conversation with former Washington tight end Logan Paulson. Tis the season to shine with H&M. Discover the holiday collection and find fashionable pieces for your wardrobe or for under the tree. Get inspired and dazzle with this year's glam. From tuxedo styles, bow detailed pieces, impressive prints, and more. From unforgettable looks to unforgettable gifts. With fashion finds to home decor, find it all at H&M. Treat your loved ones and yourself this season. Shop in-store or at hm.com. Apple Gift Card is a practical gift that unlocks a world of entertainment and fun. You can send it via email or give a physical card to your loved ones. Your friends and family can spend it on their favorite Apple services, including Apple subscriptions. Apple Gift Card can be used to buy all things Apple. Products, accessories, apps, games, movies, TV shows, iCloud Plus, and more. Visit apple.com for details and to send Apple gift cards to your friends and family this holiday season. So Logan, they 
just played. They played Mike McDaniel before the bye week. They have Sean McVay coming up this week. They have Kyle Shanahan in a couple weeks. Some highly successful coaches have done a lot of things. Obviously, they were all here, and so you know them. And it's not about like, oh, what did Washington let get away? But it's more about why are these guys so successful? And I'm going to get – in a minute, I'm going to get into some Sam and some like how do you maintain your – your professionalism during a situation like this, but I do want to start with that coaching tree and why is it so successful? Do you think? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's like a million reasons we could probably do a couple hours on this and why and the details. And what I think the main thing is if you were to, obviously you're asking me, but I think the main thing that sticks out to me is just their hunger to find edges in offensively. Right. And I think, Obviously, Kyle is a brilliant offensive coordinator. We saw what Mike could do last week, but they just are constantly striving to understand defenses, to kind of see how to break their rules with concept, how to break their rules with formation, and give the quarterback uh, some easy opportunities, you know, and, and easy is a relative term in the NFL, but just right. give them an opportunity to kind of say, hey, um, I don't need to read this out perfectly because this first dude's going to be wide open because of how we formation this. And I think, or because of how we've, distributed the field with personnel. So I think that's probably something. And I think that that translates from a leadership standpoint, being a head coach, obviously the offensive side of the ball, they're all offensive coordinators, but I think it also translates in terms of details to the defensive side of the football. And I think that's why those staffs are so prolific at the moment is they just, they they've, they've learned kind of studying under Kyle. Cause I think he's kind of the Genesis or Mike, however you want to start this, this cascade of saying, Hey, this is how we put ourselves in the best position to be successful. This is how we maximize strengths and cover up weaknesses. Cause like we've talked about this a lot over the last couple of weeks, you know, the, the commander's offensive line right now, I would say is, is playing well enough to win football games. Like they're playing better than San Fran's offensive line. They're playing better than Miami's offensive line. They're playing better than Houston's offensive line, but you don't know about those other groups because of the way that Bobby Slowick, the way that Mike McDaniel, the way that Kyle Shanahan is calling offensive football games to insulate that group. So I think that's, that, I think that's a huge element to why they're so prolific at the moment and why that tree is so prolific is just, they all learn, how to understand defenses, how to scheme defenses, and create space and matchups within the context of what the defense is presenting. So is that as much about their scheme, or is it just says more about the kind of people that attracts one another? That, you know, that Kyle is attracted to people who think this way, and those people kind of spawn off in those directions. Is it more about that, or what do you think that you attribute that to? I mean, I definitely think that's a huge element. I think when you look at the people that Kyle gravitates toward, like Kyle said this to me and it resonates with me. I think about it every day. Like I remember he was saying, I value you as a person and how you approach football. And it makes sense for him because everything in about his life is associated with football, like how you work, how you prepare, how you study, how you treat your teammates, all those things that I think would be kind of akin to being a good person, but he applies it to football. And I think like he finds people like that sean finds people like that there's a reason that their staffs become very prolific is because they find these people that are hungry and they're passionate about football and they sleep at the office and they are willing to go through an extra you know hour of cut-ups to find that 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 you know in cover three this is how the hook linebacker plays versus a two by two or whatever it is like they are passionate about that kind of stuff and it's 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 really cool to see so i think it's it's that and i think when you look at the scheme like everyone runs the same concepts you right. know they they run very similar concepts it's about when to apply the concept i think and how they apply the concept like i just was thinking back to um the game that we played against them last year san francisco and they had this play it's called scissors right it's like a mm -hmm. corner and a post and they're having george, george kittle run the run the run the corner and instead of running a true flat they like had christian mccaffrey run a bubble and everyone says oh it's a bubble it's a flat it's getting the same spot but because of the depth Christian McCaffrey got, it forced the hook player to get a little bit wider and a little bit closer to the line of scrimmage. And it makes this beautiful window for the mm -hmm. corner, you know, as opposed to saying, hey, we're going to have a traditional three level throw and you're going to have to read this out top to bottom. And if you're going to hit the corner, it's got to be an excellent throw. They just said, hey, we're going to make it so the corner is going to be there for Brock Purdy. And now Brock Purdy elevates that offense. But I think those are the types of things you're talking about, like the tweaking that concept a little bit to maximize what you're trying to get out of it, I think is really brilliant. And then I think also like the people, like I think if Kyle was running the Air Coriel system, I think he'd probably be just successful, right? Because right. it would give, because that that's like who he is as a, as a person, you know? Yeah, and it's always looking for that little advantage. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, when when we saw like the, the Dolphins leading into that game, 
you would see them run some things yeah. with Tyreek Hill, like some of those bubbles from a different sort of split to give guys better angles to get to blocks. And that's the kind of stuff you're talking about. Well, I think the thing with the, the, the Dolphins is like everyone thinks, oh, my gosh, it's this crazy offense. When you watch it, they're running drift, like, you know, right. old drift with um, with Robert Griffin III. Like either it's off a of play action or it's off a of drop back. Drop back. And they just put enough window dressing on it with the motions and the shifts and, and the different formations and the different personnels that you don't know it's the same play. They're attacking the same location on the field. The run games are beautifully designed because they're they've they've found ways to maximize their personnel. I think that's really what it comes down to. It's like here we are in this in this in this really complicated NFL version, but it's they're not doing anything overly complicated. Their presentation is very complicated. And I think there's a brilliance to that, which is so fun to watch. And again, it's it's not the presentation. It's not the plays. It's how they've said, hey, this is what we're, we're really good at. They've identified what they're good at, and they've figured out how to maximize what they're good at. And I think that's, that's, that's something that's so fun to watch when you watch those offensive groups. And so, in, and obviously, in this situation, there's four games left here, and, you know, there's no job opening yet. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, I know – there's certain roads it's harder to go down. However, in general, if you're looking for a head coach, knowing all this, like what are some of the things you'd look for just to kind of maximize what you're talking about? Yeah, and I, th I think you're looking for guys who have shown an ability to elevate talent. And so like Ben Johnson is kind of everybody's All-American at the moment because he runs the football. He he obviously has a really good understanding of that. He understands protections. He understands drop back. He understands how to maximize Jared Goff. <clears throat> and that offense has changed since Jared, Jared Goff's got there. You know, it's gotten away from kind of the traditional play action pass stuff that they were doing before. And it's kind of saying, how do we get to play action pass concepts off a of drop back protection? Because he sees it better. And I think that's, again, a testament to what they're doing. I think Frank... Uh, Frank Stevens down in um, Smith, down Smith, Smith, excuse me, down in Miami. He does a great job, man. Of, of and again, he's working with Mike McDaniel, but like they do a great job of of finding space, maximizing the run game, doing all this this stuff that we just talked about. And he just seems like the next guy in that tree that's going right. to kind of go on and do do great stuff. He's wired the right way. Football is important to him. All those different things. So for me. I want a guy that shows some shows an understanding of the way the game is going. So I know I mentioned two offensive coaches there, but for me, it's also like Dan Quinn, I think is a really good head coaching candidate. I think Raheem uh, Morris in LA is another really good head coaching candidate who are defensive background guys, yeah. but they are being innovative on the defensive side of the football. And I think Raheem is now helping with the offense. So he's got like this really eclectic background, right. but guys that understand where football is going and all this stuff we're talking about maximizing talent is another thing that I just think is so, so important. And I think they all, the other thing that's so important is that they've, they've seen how to flip a program. They've seen how to take the Detroit lions through Dan Campbell's physical mm -hmm. culture and turn it into something more. They saw what it was like in Miami and, you know, with Mike McDaniels and they've seen how to flip that Dallas, the Dallas Cowboys, that defense was terrible before Dan got right. there and he flipped them in a year. And so it's not only the schematic stuff, but it's inspiring and motivating the players and then maximizing what they're doing on the field. So I think those are kind of the three prongs of the fork that I would be looking at really closely. And then just, again, I think this is something that I often overlook because I'm so in the schematic element, but how do they relate to the guys? Like right. that's going to be something that's so, so important because you want those guys to play hard and play uh, and play impassioned for the coach. So. How important is play calling and all that? Because again, when you bring up Frank Smith, and I've heard a lot of good things about him um, from a few people, not a play caller. So how right. do you how do you view that in in the whole scheme of things? With no pun intended, with with hiring a guy. <laughs> well, I think there's a there's a pretty good precedent in recent history of guys who excuse me who haven't called plays that have been very successful. And, um, and I think the, I've said this, I said this when EV was hired, I think the hard part is learning how to schematically prep the week. You know, right. what is, what does the week look like in terms of getting stuff ready to go? Because I think on the game day, if you've coached it correctly and you've picked the right stuff on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the players should take over. And that, that's something that I think Mike has kind of brought to the forefront of like this elite coaching conversation is like, you do everything you can to put them in the right spot but ultimately the players got to make it come to life. And so there, there are times where you're watching 
Kyle, where you're watching Mike and Kyle could call anything, you know, anything that he feels is appropriate. Cause he's prepped that already. He's prepped that on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever it is. And, <clears throat> and I think those, those, that preparation is the most important thing and making sure you've coached it correctly, coached it versus the looks you, you're expecting. And I think that's where those guys um, have maximized. So as, as far as play calling goes, I don't think it's super critical. Obviously it's a factor like getting in the rhythm and flow of a game and all that stuff is super important, but I do think it's to me, the harder thing to learn is how to prep this concept versus this defense. How do we formation this concept? to maximize it against this defense how do we coach it to say hey guys we got to tighten the split here we got to widen the split we got to make sure we get this depth we got to catch this guy's eyes so that this player comes open for us that's all to me more complicated and um, I think the other thing that's super important is understanding um, and this is something that EB's kind of had a tough time with because he didn't get this opportunity understanding who you're bringing in from a position coach standpoint and I think when you when you talk to you know Frank Smith and talk to some of these other coaches that I've got pretty good relationships with. One of the things that sticks out is like, they know the people under them, the receiver coach, the line coach, the running back coach that can help get that vision across and help them maximize the offense, which I think is another huge, huge variable. And again, you've seen, they've seen how that all, all that preparation works together um, in terms of the staff. And so all that stuff is just so important. Staff prep, all the, but that's all I haven't even talked about calling plays, but that right. to me is the important foundational stuff. Right. And that's why I bring it up. Cause you know, to me, it just, if you're a good play caller, it doesn't mean you're going to be a good head coach and that, you know, and, and that's something I've always believed in, but um, cause there's so many other elements to it. But speaking of EB, when you talk about the staff, how much does that hurt an offensive guy when you're coming in and you're not, not to, I'm not blaming whatever it's just, but it's not your staff. It's they're yeah. not your guys necessarily. You know, I haven't talked to anybody in the building about this, but I would imagine it's tremendously difficult, I think, because you you have vision. You have a vision for what a concept should look like, right? And so you draw it up on the board and you say, hey, this is shallow cross. This is our shallow cross concept. But it's the devil's in the details, man. And if I don't have a receiver coach that's been with me and understands the details I want to emphasize, I now have to kind of oversee the receiver coach to make sure that he's coaching it the way I want to coach. I have to talk to the quarterback coach more. And and, th- and that that's always an open line of communication, but more time has to be spent at the, at the position group level to make sure that the vision is being executed the way you want. So that, again, I think that detracts big picture schematically from what you feel comfortable doing, because if you can't get the basic stuff dialed in the way you want, then, um, and I'm not saying this is the case here, but I'm just right, assuming, right, right. I'm assuming that this is the issue. What, what, uh, this is an issue. Right. It's because when you have all guys that you know, like when you have all the people that you've been working with, the guys that have been in the system, it's like you're all speaking the same language. Right. Install goes more smoothly. But there's more correction time if if you guys aren't on the same page. And it, and I think it limits what you feel comfortable calling. It limits what you feel comfortable doing. And I think you know when it comes to the offensive line coach specifically – and again, this is not an indictment of Castillo because I think Castillo does a really good job and he's helped those guys from a technical standpoint tremendously. But I don't feel comfortable if my run game coordinator is calling, is kind of in, in a different mindset, right? We're not on the same page. We're still learning each other. And I think, uh, you know, I always bring this up, but like Kyle always said, it takes three years to learn an offense. Part of the reason is like the details and figuring out what guys can and can't do well is part of it. And I think like here, you still see like, I think, the offensive line, for example, here's done an excellent job in certain situations, but there is there does seem to be a disconnect at times between EB's vision of the offense and then Juan's perspective in terms of how we get to certain runs. So I think it's 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 a very complicated thing. And I think again, both coaches are probably doing what they think is best, but there's a communication disconnect, at least to my eye, that it, that makes it challenging to maximize the offense, if that makes sense. It it does. And, and cause they're also coming from different perspectives as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, and different coaching experiences. And so, but it's also, you know, obviously with EB, you know, a lot of players have chafed under him and again, not to, you know, to speak directly to that, but I am curious, like if you have a coach who's of his demeanor, whatever it is, but you have guys under who coach for him. How much does that help the position players who maybe understand that guy better? You know what I'm saying? I, I don't yeah. know if that, I don't even I, know if, that, if that's a big deal or not, but. 
I think I think it would be very helpful because again, like the more people that know you, that know I'm I'm talking about EB that know yeah. how you operate. I, if I'm the position coach and I and he gets mad at the tight ends, I'm like, hey, you know, he's mad, but like just make sure we get that coaching point locked in. Like he's mad, but he does it because he loves you or whatever. I can right, kind right. of be the buffer there as the position coach, and I think um, I think that's a big part uh, that that also is a potential point of friction, right? Is that you get coaches who don't are who are learning eb and then players are learning new coaches it, it just it's very very challenging in terms of line of communication it's like if you were starting your own business and for whatever reason like you just had a whole staff in place that no one knew what you were thinking no one knew what you wanted you never worked with anyone before and that's going to be very very challenging i know he's brought in a couple of the coaches but right you know the, the big ones the offensive line coach like that that's a tough one and i think again i think Juan's done a good job it's just you got to teach one what you want an adjustment. And yeah absolutely and i think people i know i often forget how challenging that must have been for eb but it's something that um, i'm trying to remind myself more of now as the season's coming to a close yeah and and i i think it's always helpful to have because one thing you always hear and i know like with with josh harris for example the as an owner what you want is to somebody you don't want to sit there and have to meddle in all this you want to have people who can carry out you know you guys have you have a shared vision right and you're communicating it to them and then they kind of go spread your they gospel, so to speak. Yeah. They executed. And execute. I think yeah. that's exactly what you're talking about here with EB. It's, but now imagine in that example of Josh Harris had to teach the director of sales, like how right. he wanted the sale project to go. Right. Because he'd never been in the sales structure that Josh Harris wanted to execute. So I, I think there's, there, there, that's a very good analogy. And I think, again, it must've been very challenging for EB at points this year because not only are you teaching the players, but you're teaching the coaches. And I'm sure at times that message, you just, just by default, just because of the lack of experience between the two parties ends up being a little bit skewed at times. A couple more topics um, with Sam Howell. How do you feel he's done lately? And what are you looking for over the next four weeks? Yeah. I mean, I think there's um, it's tough because I, I really like what Sam has done at points this season. I think you see a guy who's, got the potential to be a starting caliber NFL, NFL quarterback and someone that you could potentially build a franchise around. And, you know, I haven't done started my draft prep yet, but that'll happen soon. Right. And I know they're going to be picking top five, but, I, you know, I was talking to somebody, if you think Sam's a guy, you can trade out of that spot and kind of have a franchise changing draft because you'll have two first round picks, an early second round, and then the roster is in flux with a whole bunch of young, talented guys and you're ready to rock and roll around a young quarterback still on his rookie deal. <clears throat> I think... Obviously, that's something that would be fantastic for the organization. But I think there are questions that still remain about Sam. And there are, um, you know, specifically in that Miami game, like I talked about it on the on the on the podcast I do with Craig. Take command. And one of the, yeah, take command. And one of the things that stuck out to me was the evaluation was so tough, right? Because you were having issues on the offensive line. You were having issues with the receivers. You were having issues, at least to my eye, with the best way formationally to execute certain concepts issues with calls at certain points and again like everybody had blame in that and I think it just made it really really hard to see where Sam is at right. right now it feels like he's regressed a little bit but I think when you look at how the offense has played the last two weeks I think that regression is probably it's probably unfair to put that all on Sam I think you've played better defenses they've executed the defenses have executed better against this offense and I think you even when you look at the the Giants game for example like I watched that film and I'm like Man, this is a this is a really nice blitz here. That's creating a free runner. This is a this is a great uh, TT inside. That's creating a free runner uh, from a defensive tackle. Hey, they've matched this concept better than I expected. There's really nowhere to go with the football, and so like there's layers to the evaluation. And I just hope that over the last couple of weeks of the season we can get like a clean evaluation of where he's at. And again, we're playing good teams. We're playing good defenses. It's going to be challenging to get that, but I think you know I, I trust DB to kind of take a good look at what they've been doing over the bye week and say, Hey man, we can do some of this stuff better to maximize Sam much like he did after the giants game where you saw Sam kind of come back to life for two or three games. So right. that's kind of what I'm hoping because I think over the last two games, it's really, really hard to say, this is where Sam's at. This is what I think of Sam. And again, like from the course of the season, I'm very, very high on Sam, but mm -hmm. I'd like to see him in terms of me kind of not picking Right, a, t a player, you know, a quarterback in the top five picks. I need, I want, I want a little bit more in terms of evaluation and data saying, hey, he's trending in the right direction. If that makes sense. Oh, it absolutely does. And I think you know, you you bring up a good point. Like to me, the offense has regressed. I mean, I, it's disappointing in that Dolphins game to see a lot too many times where 
I didn't, I didn't understand the spacing of the receivers or sure. the timing of the receivers, which then makes it hard on the quarterback and the coverage. And then sometimes if you're waiting for McLaurin to break open deep and then you're not getting the time. So it yeah. all adds into it, but, but it is a big decision going forward, regardless of who's coaching here is, you know, can he, is he that guy? Because it does, it's, you're, you're going to take a big swing one way or another. If he's not, if he is, then like you said, you can trade and you can get more and you can build around him and really build something strong possibly. Yeah. But if you're not sold, then you got to go in that direction. And that makes, then you're kind of going in a, you know, you're, you're having to to start build at that same position again, which makes it hard yeah. to then fortify around you as much as you would want to. Yeah. But I also think like, you know, it, it wouldn't be bad. I know a lot of fans feel like you're starting over if you draft a new quarterback, but if you're evaluating, and again, I haven't started my evaluation on these guys, right. but if your evaluation is strong, trust it, you know, yeah. trust that this is well, the guy. And, and, you know, I think you look at like CJ Stroud or whoever from last year's draft class, obviously it's a little bit of a crapshoot with quarterbacks in the first round, but if you hit on that guy, it's, it's franchise changing. I and mean, we were talking about Houston, maybe being the worst roster in the NFL coming to this season, but you so wouldn't know it now, right? right. You wouldn't know it because of what they've done at the quarterback position. So I think if you hit on that position, it's it, it's it's worth it. Like, it, it, don't think of it as a restart fan base. It's it's an opportunity for something very very special if it's the right kid. So well, and I my belief is if you like the court, if you're not sold on player X and you love player Y, you take player Y, especially at this position because it's so important. It's more important right. than any other spot that you don't pass it up, pass up someone that you, it, now, if it's a, well, I kind of like this guy. I'm not sure. I'm, mm. I would be hesitant to go there, but if you're sold on a guy, then right. you take the guy you're sold on and you live with your conviction. So last thing is very last thing, obviously four weeks left have not played well. Yeah. How to, and you know, all this talk about coaching situations here and the changing everything in the organization, how tough is this for a player and how do you get through it? It's extremely tough. It's extremely tough. I, and there's no two ways about it. I think this is, this reminds me a lot of like 2013 when yeah. I was here and there was that whole, uh, you know, Mike and Dan were button heads and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and it was very public in the media yeah. and all that stuff. And you kind of knew, you knew that it wasn't going to end well for the staff. And that that is really hard. for It was really hard for me. Let me just say that. Because you've built relationships with all these guys, yeah. right? You know, like, I remember going in and seeing some of the young coaches on the staff crying. Mm. Like, grown men really upset because I think they knew the direction it was going. And it's it's more about your friends and, and your opportunities. And the only way that I was able to kind of, like, emotionally survive that, those really tough coaching changes was – Basically, like, Logan, do you want to be an NFL football player next year? Yes. You need to make sure you're performing like an NFL football player these last four weeks. And it's tough because the everyone in the building is is dragging. Um, there's people in the locker room with different motivations, like guys who are established veterans who make a lot of money, kind of know they're going to be here next year. They They approach the week differently. They kind of take their foot off the gas a little bit. They're worried about not getting hurt. And you cannot let that pull you down you got to say i got to stay focused i got to stay dialed in and um it's it, it's just very challenging because friends are moving on guys are getting fired families are lives are changing and everyone thinks about oh you know ron he's gonna if he if he does get fired which it looks like that's gonna happen at the end of the year um you know i don't feel bad for ron because he's gonna get paid yeah that's great ron's gonna get paid but think about every assistant coach on the staff who's making like coaching minimum all these players that have been brought in to be part of this organization that um, that we're here because of the 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 Ron Rivera staff that are going to have to find new jobs next year. Like it's it's a very tough time, and it's really just kind of saying like, what can I do as a player to survive the, this process, and how do I be the best professional I can be? And I and I say that word with a lot of respect because it takes a lot. You know, how do I maintain my professionalism going into this these last four weeks? And um, everyone's going to have a different process, but it's going to be so so important to find a way to do that. It is. And it's also, you know, you're looking at a changeover in the front office. So it's a yeah. lot of people like scouts. I mean, they're going to be a lot of people affected by this and not to say if it's deserved or not deserved. It's just that the bottom line is there are a lot of people are affected, which trickles down into the locker yeah. room. So anyway, Logan, you're the best. Tell people where they can find you. I know Instagram, you got the take command podcast with Craig Hoffman. Tell yeah, me. Um, Instagram, Logan underscore Paulson82, Take Command with Craig, uh, the Command Center podcast, which is on the Commander's YouTube page. And then we do other shows and stuff there. I do pregame um, on 106.7 The Fan. So 
I'm in a lot of spots and, uh, you know, make sure you guys check out the content. And there's going to be a lot of good stuff in the off season because yeah. of all the free agency stuff, but also the draft in right. addition to whatever happens with the coaching staff, the player acquisition is going to be huge this off season. So thanks a lot, Logan. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. The holidays start here at Kroger with a variety of options to celebrate traditions old and new. You could do a classic herb roasted turkey or spice it up and make turkey tacos. Serve up a go-to shrimp cocktail or use Simple Truth wild-caught shrimp for your first Cajun risotto. Make creamy mac and cheese or a spinach artichoke fondue from our selection of Murray's cheese. No matter how you shop, Kroger has all the freshest ingredients to embrace all your holiday traditions. Kroger, fresh for everyone. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Some things are just better together, like party playlists and Friday nights campfires and ghost stories, peanut butter and chocolate. And Reese's Cups are the perfect combination of creamy peanut butter and delicious milk chocolate. So, when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Buy Reese's today wherever candy is sold. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Logan for joining me, and thank you, as always, for tuning in. I'll be back on Friday with another episode. Talk to you next time.